Hi, welcome everyone. It's Patricia Albert and it's Evolutionary Collective Conversations and I'm uh, very excited about the conversation that we're about to have with Nora Bateson. The title of the show is What is the Pattern that Connects All of Life? And there is a breakthrough in consciousness that's just beginning to unfold um, I think around the world for different people and as we pay more and more attention, uh, people are starting to experience more of their interconnectedness, um, more of the interdependence. I think the internet and, and many other things are beginning to show us that we are truly connected and we're starting to see, you know, so, some people are, not everybody, um, larger patterns, you know, through that, that interweaving and that interconnectedness. Um, and it's important. Uh, I think Nora will speak about it and you know, we've been talking about that it's actually an important state of consciousness to begin to embrace if we're really going to meet the challenges that are ahead of us. She was very fortunate um, to have an awesome father, who uh, Gregory Bateson, who was a, really a genius. He was a scientist, a cyberneticist, a psychologist, an anthropologist, and and I think he would he would probably resist being called any particular um, thing because he was really a genius in so many different fields and his particular message had to do with how everything is connected and um, he was he was quite um, she'll tell you but you know divisions weren't his favorite topic I don't think um, and he made an extraordinary contribution I remember hearing about him when I was in my twenties he was I don't remember what they did we'll have to, I'll have to hear about this from you Nora when, when we when I'm done introducing you um, but I know that he knew Warner Earhart um, way back and was, was a part of, you know, some conversations back then. So I, I did, did hear about him, but I, I wasn't, um, I guess I was too busy just trying to work on staff to, to be able to really deeply explore the perspective that he was, he was presenting. Nora um, is, an ex is here with us today, and she's a brilliant filmmaker and the daughter of the late Gregory Bateson. And her film, which is also unbelievable. I've watched it five times, um, and I have, <laughs> almost six, and uh, it's just it, in an hour for her to even attempt to express the kind of complexity of his ideas uh, is unbelievable, and she's done a brilliant job and done it from a, a place of relatedness, uh, which is actually really beautiful. So she's been on the road. It's called An Ecology of Mind, and she's been traveling all over the world, uh, presenting it and showing it to, to thousands of people everywhere. And uh, people have said really, uh, one from the Huffington Post, there's just one thing I want to say and then we'll get into the conversation. Um, but the woman who wrote the, the article, the interview said that she presents viewers with not only an intellectually challenging and inspiring work of art, but with a glimpse of evanescent hope. And, um, and I, I concur with that. So... I want to welcome you, Nora, to Evolution. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. And uh, thank you for, um, for watching my film five times. I know. <laughs> it's so good. I mean, to me, God, you know, I wish I had known him. Um, just he was such a forerunner of the consciousness that I'm so a champion of. Uh, I really, I mean, you know, when you when you hear of someone who was living something and, and then had the courage to try to explain and uh, induct the world in a certain way of perceiving, he was just a maverick. I mean, just unbelievable. So I want to hear more. So your father, uh, so, so first of all, An Ecology of Mind is the name of the, the film. And obviously it was it was one of his books as well. Do you want to speak to, you know, what that means? Yeah, I will. I think that's a really good place to start. Okay. Um, you said a moment ago that uh, Gregory was an anthropologist and a psychologist and a, and a cyberneticist and an information theorist and an ecologist and a biologist. And, a, yeah. and um, it is, um, it's easy to get into the kind of categorizing that we um, are trained to actually identify people and ideas and, and entire bodies of thought with. Um, 
And lately I've been noticing sort of around the discussion of what is interdisciplinary conversation, what is interdisciplinary curriculum, um, what does it mean to be interdisciplinary? Mm-hmm. And and looking at G- Gregory's work as an interdisciplinary and then realizing, wait a minute, mm-hmm. it's not interdisciplinary at all because that would mean that there were differences in what he was, that there were disciplines. And what was right. happening there, while it might seem like he was doing a lot of different things, really what he was doing was looking through the same lens at different manifestations of the same pattern. Mm-hmm. Okay, yes. so when you're talking about the pattern that connects, which is the term that he used to kind of talk about the, 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 the dynamics of the way that life works and interrelationship and communication, that he was looking at that in terms of biology, in terms of behavior, mm-hmm. in terms of communication. But he was looking for the patterns, the same patterns through the same lens. And this business of interdisciplinary Narity right. is something we attach to it. Right. So I think that's a, a good place to start with the idea of what is an ecology of mind because we've become very com- comfortable with it. Um, a notion of ecology as pertaining to, okay, a loose definition of ecology might be the totality of patterns of relationship between an organism and its environment. Okay, mm-hmm. that's, that's that's a good. pretty solid base. Okay, and we are likely to attribute something like that to the 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 way that a pond is functioning with its algae and its fishes and its mud and the minerals and the oxygen and the okay, we can start to do totality of pattern of organism and environment in that way, right? Or uh, a forest floor, and we can think about the earthworms and the various insects, and again, the minerals and the decomposing bits of tree foliage. But when we take that notion of ecology and we bump it another level to look at the patterns of interrelationship and responses, interaction, interpretation, not so much... Um, between algae and oxygen, but between the ideas that you carry in your mind, between the ideas in your head. How are your ideas interacting? Which ones are composting? Which ones are blooming? Right? Where? Which, which ones do you wish were composting? <laughs> Where are the you know the the, the volunteers? Um, that we get a different kind of understanding about not only ecology in the pond and the forest by looking at the relationship, mental process and biological structures, but also, and I think this is very important, ecologies change and we know that. Mm -hmm. Because these, these elements, these participants are in relation to each other, responding to each other, there's always change. There's always learning. So so the idea Mm -hmm. that ideas can't change is just an idea and not a very good one. Um, So I like to work with an ecology of mind because of that, because I think we have a lot of ideas that we might feel feel like aren't aren't in an ecology they aren't changeable they're right. not in response to they're not in relation they're not alive well he but they're alive he said um that everything was just an unending series of relationships you know everything is about relatedness which is not the way most people think you know most people think more like objects or processes to some degree but you know, like what you're saying, if like you're when lucky. you think of your, you know, your ecology of mind, you know, these different thoughts and feelings and perspectives are shaping your, your actions. I mean, they're influencing you and, and you're being influenced. I mean, one of the things I find, you know, just because my, I, 
I tend to be pretty transparent. I can hear the other people's thoughts and stuff. Is that half the time, I don't even even know if sometimes it's my thought. Mm. You know, I think the more open we get, you, it's hard to know whose who's thinking is influencing you anyway. So what would you say to that or what do you think and, you would say? Well, I would say that I'm not sure it matters. Right. It probably does. Um, I think... <laughs> in in some ways, it's impossible to trace yeah, back uh, where these thoughts come from. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I often get this even in terms of the question of, well, Nora, are you carrying on your father's legacy? Is that what's going mm -hmm. on here? And that's a difficult question to answer because, um, you know, where do the ideas come from? Anyway, right. And how did they, what are they doing in my realm and in the context of right now? Right. Um, in, the, in the, the environment, and the environment that he was in affecting them and then his father before him and so right. on and so forth and all the different influences and yeah, so on. So, um it, it is a question of, well, it doesn't, on some level, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Just to be able to look at the, the ideas, um, whether they're, you know, Bateson's ideas or, or just the ideas of our culture mm -hmm. or the rhetoric of the, you know, the political spin of the moment. Right. And just to have a certain kind of, um, a certain kind of leverage of, being able to notice how they function in response and in relationship to each other. So that what's important is not the ideas, mm -hmm. even. It's the relationship between them. How has and that's that business of thinking in, in, in relational ways. Yeah. How um, do you notice that your consciousness is different? Like, how do you notice, like... What is your consciousness like being immersed in the particular reality that he was proposing, you know, that he was bringing forth? I have no way of answering that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't because I don't know anything else. Yeah, that's true. So um, I have no contrast. Mm -hmm. um, I can't. I can't say this. I'm really enjoying the work that I'm doing right now uh -huh. and engaging in the conversations that I'm engaging in that are mm -hmm. sort of spinning from his ideas and the things he left behind and how I'm beginning to play with them and what they mean, the relevance that they have now. Yeah, speak more uh, about that is, because it does seem like yeah, he he would have to be so excited, you know, showing up in 2012, because <laughs> there, there it would have to be a different world to be to to be sharing what he was sharing than it was like in 1960 something. It, exactly, with so, a whole different vocabulary of experience. Mm -hmm. Um, all mentions of generational character and learning and information and and whatever the chemistry, whatever the ecology is mm -hmm. of our our cultural need right now. Yeah. Um, the the ideas and the conversation around around these ideas is suddenly gaining a momentum and traction and um, and people really are not glossing over. I remember when I was a kid sitting in his workshops and listening to him speak and watching the audience kind of go out. <laughs> <laughs> Glaze over. And, and that's not happening. Interesting. That's, that's people are coming now. towards the ideas. Yeah. yeah. And... and um, and they're looking for new ways mm -hmm. of thinking in a really voracious kind of hungry way. It's a, it's a whole different um, whole different temperature yeah, of interest. Um, and, and question: uh, One of the things that that hit me, and, and some people will understand this, and some people won't. But when you listen to him, the complexity of, you know, I was recently in LA and was speaking with someone who you could tell like we were talking on like five different frequencies at the same time. 
you know, it was like having different radio frequencies that were lit up. And, you know, your dad was just the level of complexity that he was dealing at, with simplicity. Do you know what I mean? With a certain effortlessness um, speaks to like in the, in the spiral dynamics model, you know, or integral theory. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's, it's a different level of consciousness. It's like an integral level of consciousness. It's culturally different, you know, than it was in the 1960s, you know, when Mad Men was more the cultural mm -hmm. meme. <laughs> so I wonder, too, like there seems to be, you know, do you, are you familiar with that at all, the spiral dynamic stuff or just as a question? A little bit. A little um, bit because he was definitely. I think what you're getting at is that he, he liked to yeah. play with the levels. And he, yeah, and play is a, an important word in that sentence, and so is levels. Um, and very often he, uh, he would say things that would mean several different things on several different levels. Totally. And in the film, there's, you can see that he does that, that particularly with, with humor. Yeah. Um, and there's one sequence that for our audience who may or may not have seen the film, there's a sequence that I refer to as the boot film in which Gregory draws a geometrical shape and says, how would you describe this shape? And by the end, it's, it's largely uncut. It's like this gut 70s footage from, you know, some beast of a video camera that uh, had bad sound and everything, but it's priceless. I love that footage. Yeah. And I didn't, I banned it because it was so great, just the way it was. And in whatever it is, essentially a four-minute uncut clip, he takes down geometry, psychology, um, cognitive science, uh, description, language, Everything. and you come out the other side laughing. Yeah, that's Not true. really, you know, it, and, and suddenly there's this sort of this lightness of, of having gone to a level of complexity in which all these definitions fell to pieces. That's true. And, that's brilliant. And there's just... And it's great, you know. Um, so I think that's the sort of thing that you're getting at. Yeah. And it has to do with, uh, with a, a oh, you know, I think, sometimes I think it's a muscle. That he just, he was really mm -hmm. good at being able to see things um, in their dynamic and interrelational uh, wholeness. Mm -hmm. It, they were intact, um, and intact and in process at the same time. Right. And and so he could look in closely and look out and see larger context without missing a beat. Right. Simultaneously. And what we do, yeah. Right. Is I mean, I we can hold that focus for one or two seconds, one or two minutes, maybe right. an hour if we're really working at it, but then something comes along that triggers our, our stuff and, you know, by God, we're right back down in the grooves and, true. you know, but that's, that's so wrong. <laughs> okay, well, so hold on one moment. We're going to just take a quick break. So I'm speaking with Nora Bateson, who's a filmmaker and the daughter of Gregory Bateson. She made an amazing film, which, as I've said, I've watched five times. Uh, called An Ecology of Mind, and we're going to come back in just a moment. Okay, so this is Patricia Albert, and I'm with Nora Bateson, and we're speaking about An Ecology of Mind, a film that she's been taking around the world about her brilliant and amazing father, Gregory Bateson, and she just said some amazing things. I mean, holding the consciousness, so I, I love this, this conversation, because he, he had, you know, that multidimensional... Like when you listen to the film, so I hope everyone will, will definitely either go see the film or I guess there's a way to buy it. We'll um, you know, talk about that towards the end of the show. Is you can feel your brain coming apart. So to whatever degree you want to think in a linear way, in the normal way, the conventional way that most human beings think, um, and in a more superficial way, which I think we sort of, that's the natural place that we go to. You just get undone. Like by the time you're finished listening to him for like, you know, two minutes, you're just kind of going, 
uh, you know, like, I don't know. And then you're immensely, I mean, the way I felt was I was immensely curious. I was just so like, oh, I just want to hang out with him and look at everything from that perspective. So I just wanted to say mm-hmm. that this is just very exciting. He, I, here's another um, pers- uh, thing that I wanted to ask you about was he said the difference that makes a difference was one of his things that he was a line, you know, a, a perspective that he brought forth. What does that mean? <clears throat> okay. Well, there's a number of diff- different ways to look at that concept. And um, in the film, there's it's mostly dealt with in terms of ways in which we can uh, begin to define and describe because um, the, in, the movie's are really about looking at the world, whether it's your personal life, the thoughts in your head, the mm-hmm. socio-political uh, situation, the environment, whatever it is, in, in, a, in terms of its, its relationships and its context. Mm-hmm. Okay, so not in terms of its bits, but in terms of their relationship. So in the film, I used the difference that makes a difference as a tool to begin to uh, define find things in term in a different way so that you don't say um, these are fingers on a hand mm-hmm. but that these are the spaces between the fingers that articulate the possibilities of what this thing might mm-hmm. do okay otherwise it's a paddle right it's a t- completely different right. thing um, so but because there's difference that there's there's um, there's dynamics, there's relationship, uh-huh. and that articulates a different a different a whole different way of di- defining. Okay, that's one piece of that mm-hmm. concept, um, an important piece, but it's only one piece because another piece is that that um, that at the sort of zoom in level. Uh, our tools in our world and our way of researching, our methodologies are all about zooming in. Microscopes, data, statistics, zoom in. Um, and it's very important that we do that because it gives us the, it's at that level that we get information. Mm-hmm. Okay, the information about how your heart functions differently than your lungs. That's important information about what the relationship is. Right. Um, and the difference that makes a difference offers us uh, a, a, a way in which to get information about how things are in relationship, which is really important. But it's more important to keep that in perspective and to, to know that as you started off this discussion mm-hmm. with the idea of the pattern that connects, yeah. that we can then also zoom out and and see those differences and those relationships blurred into larger rhythms and patterns. They have a context that they exist within. And they have this minutia that they create diversity and vitality with together. Mm -hmm. So this business of being able to go in and out offers, I think... um, I think that's the first really big tool and practice toward um, looking at things in a different way and being able to hold that focus. Mm -hmm. In the film, my sister says something, um, and I think it's so generous what she says. She says, uh, what is it about the way that we see the world that makes us not see the delicate interdependencies? We don't see them, so we break them. And it's that notion of if we could see those delicate interdependencies, we might not break them. And, you know, I I love the generosity that she offers, Mm -hmm. that that that's the issue, that we can't see it. And if we could, we wouldn't. If you just, and so, if you took that one notion, which is and brought it just to, let's say, interpersonal relationships. You know, there's a, um, Jeff and I have talked about, like, you know, we're working really to further exactly what 
your father was doing. I mean, I, that was why I watched it five times. I just, I was just like so happy. Um, but to teach people to be more sensitive to the delicacy, to, I mean, to the awareness of exactly what is actually happening in the space between us so that you can be in a better dance and mm -hmm. know what's going on. Cause most of the time, like what your sister said, we don't even realize how we affect each other and we affect life brutally. And we didn't even know we did it. Right. I mean, and the same thing with, with right. obviously the ecology of the world, but I'm, I'm sort of more interested in the, in the related relationships part of it. Um, well, you can't do one without the other. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that if, if you're, if you have the ability to see in that way, you will see in, Everywhere. in the, in the broad scope and in the and in the small scope with the little brushes and with the big brushes so I think you know Gregory used to talk about that it was we put a lot of emphasis on action mm -hmm. um, but what governs our actions right our perception our perception governs our actions what does it occur to us to do why does it occur to us to do things Right. Because of the way we're perceiving. Totally. And so change at the level of perception is a whole different order of change where you're not out running around putting out fires in every which way mm -hmm. because largely they're, they're stemming from the same source. I um, think, you know what, I just got the connection with him and Werner because Werner was all about that your action is in a correlate with the occurring. Like the way something occurs mm. to you, which is perception, is the way you act. You're in a dance with it. And I, I, I'm certain there were some conversations back then, you know, that probably had something to do with I'm that. I'm certain of it, too. Yeah. And, you know, but the thing is, is that there are a lot of people who are systems theorists, mm -hmm. who are um, cyberneticians, who have been working with systems ideas and right. so on. Um. And one of the things that I have noticed, a couple things. One, people talk about how difficult Gregory's books are to read. <laughs> have you read Steps to an Ecology of Mine? Not yet. You can tell the truth. I have not yet. yet. Okay, well, it'll be easier after having seen the film because you're, you're through the, the threshold. <laughs> um, but what, one, of the, yeah, one of the things you'll notice is how careful he is with language. Mm -hmm. And yes. for people coming in for the first time, they want him to just get to the point. Um, and there's a very careful thing going on with the way that he's, he's articulating mm -hmm. um, so that he doesn't cross and, and, um, and rigidify, if that's, I think that's a word. Yeah, um, the, the concepts and, and mm -hmm. to re, well, to reify, but to make it rigid. Right. You know, there's a real need to be very careful not to make the wrong things rigid. At what level are things is the order, and at what level are things changing? And so that that's that's something, um, and that's very different in the way that he writes. And his explanations leave this different this different kind of space. The reason that it does is because. And I think when you see the film, you can see this. And if you, later you're reading the books, you can read it in there also. It is because of a, a, a kind of caring mm -hmm. that he had. Yeah. Um, you can divide the world up a lot of different ways and explain it in an in infinite vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And the question at the end of it all is... What do you see, and do you love it? <laughs> and is there beauty in and it? That, is it beautiful? Is there beauty in it? Yeah, that, that's right. Is it beautiful? Mm -hmm. And that that notion of that sort of aesthetic response is a kind of uh, is a kind of integrated empathy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and it integrates all different parts of the mind. Uh, and the emotions, and the the physical relationship, and the all these things are integrated in that aesthetic response. Yeah. That is uh, is is this empathetic 
relational um, uh, beginning. And from that, an entirely different body of ethics comes to be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Entirely different, yeah. which, is, which is about the, those delicate interdependencies, whether they're at the level of protozoa or orcas or you and yeah. me or the relationship between Iran and China, yeah. um, those delicate interdependencies take on another whole meaning. Mm -hmm. Well, it, one of the things you can feel, because to me, you know, just from, from my particular perspective, I'm very aware of the consciousness and the, like, to me, your, your father, like, was exuding, you know, there, there was curiosity, there was an open-endedness, I, and I don't know how he did it, you know, I mean, I, I definitely am enjoying, I will definitely get the book, because that's the next step, <laughs> is that, like you're saying, his caring and his way of doing this, he did manage to keep like that flow, you know, there's an openness and flow that, that's endless that, that you can feel around him. And mm -hmm. most, most brilliant genius type people, you know, try to make, you know, put a stake in the, in the ground and say, okay, and this is my theory. And, 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 and. and he was, even though he has, you know, it's clear what his, the message and the music that was coming from him, but somehow it was, op it kept going and kept going and kept going. And I don't know how he did that. I mean, that's just amazing. Because he wouldn't he make it wouldn't, rigid. He, wouldn't. he just, he wouldn't do it. It yeah. was, there's, um, that exquisite. was what was sacred. Yeah, that was, that, is and that this, is what's sacred. This, you know, as far as I, right. I'm concerned, that is the beauty of um, relatedness. I mean, the, the relatedness and that the way that you were explaining ecology, it's, it's always arising and coming and going. There's nothing unchanging ever in that. I mean, there's things that and don't change. And things get defined very differently when you start looking through that lens. I yeah. recently did a workshop with a group of architects in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And um, the premise of the workshop was that we took five words, of which I think... I can only remember four right now. Okay. Symmetry, entropy, okay. story, and the sacred. Four words. Great. And the, the architects broke into groups and went to, to sort of find, uh, make something having to do with their word. Okay? And at the end of the day, we came back together. And... The symmetry participants had their little piece, and the entropy participants <laughs> had their little piece, and the story participants had their little piece, and the sacred people had their little piece. The word we used actually was sacrament, but anyway, we used the sacred because it's easier to understand. Um, and what we found out was this, is that symmetry in process requires entropy. Uh-huh. It becomes a balancing process. Mm -hmm. And that entropy, the relationship between symmetry and entropy, by nature is story. That that process is story. <laughs> and then that, that story and that process of entropy and symmetry coming together is part of the grace of the way things come to order. Mm -hmm whether it's the way that you and I unfold a conversation or the way a vine goes up a tree. Wow. There is a, a yeah, combination yeah. of all of those things happening. Mm -hmm. And that is a really good example of ecological thinking. Yeah, beautiful. How do you find it makes your, just on a simple level, like your relationship, let's say, with your husband, I mean, how do you find that your consciousness together, you know, what changes, mm -hmm. how does it make it different? You know, just when you're dealing with normal human. <laughs> it, it makes a really big difference. Well, sure. I mean, you know, I would be lying if I didn't say, we don't, we, oh, we don't have fights, everything's perfect. Yeah. You know? <laughs> no, because it's process. Yeah. It's process, and we're we're growing, and we, um, 
That's, that's sure. what it is. But one of the things that I have become very aware of, and it's interesting that you're asking me this question right now because <laughs> I've been working, um, particularly with this idea of, you know, what is marriage? Mm-hmm. How do, what are the kind of cultural and traditional traps of the mythology and the metaphor of what we've defined marriage as that are creating limits around which we, ke- we, we have to create trauma right. to, um, to expand. Mm-hmm. And I think you can take those same questions and apply them in all manner of ways of you know, sure. education or politics or, you know, where are the sort of the glass edges mm-hmm. that are written into the metaphor that trap us from being able to make it what it needs to be for us. Yeah. Yes, Where, you know, beautiful. after 20 years, my husband and I are like, okay, so the marriage that we had is, is different than the marriage that we need to have. Yeah. It's not that we don't need to be married. Right. It's that the marriage needs to be rewritten mm-hmm. so that it, it accompanies us and our relationship, which is at a different level than the structure of the marriage. Mm-hmm. So where is the relationship? That's here. What is the structure of the marriage and how does it support the relationship? And we often get into the, the, the territory, mm-hmm. whether it's in parenting or, you know, in the office, in hierarchical relationships, in our notion of authority and what our idea of success. I mean, you could make a long list. Totally. But that those metaphors themselves are full of traps. And um, so it's like you have to kind of, find the edges Mm -hmm. and figure out, wait a second, how do we work with this so that it can grow together so that we can learn through it together? Yeah. So and then the cultural pieces, you know, I mean the perspective and the consciousness that Gregory's, you know, seemed to bring into the world, it innately was always pushing at all that all the cultural edges too that we swim in that we don't even realize. I mean, I I, I spoke briefly with a um, I have a client who's 85, who's this amazing artist, and she's married to a, a Swiss guy, you know, a Swiss mm-hmm. his you know wealthy guy, and she's he's he's died right you know in his 90s, and she just bought art for the first time. She's an artist, okay. And she's just bought this amazing piece of art and she broke through. She says, I never realized I was allowed to buy fabulous clothes and other things, but, but there was some unspoken rule called, I can't buy art, which makes right. sense for somebody who was born then, you know, like when my, when my mom was born and it's, it seems, you know, it's, it's simple, but in a way it's that same, like there's a cultural paradigm around marriage or around being a woman or around being whatever that keeps us limited and we don't even realize we can't think outside those thoughts. That's right. I mean, one of the, the, the things that I, I see the most is, um, and I learned particularly from my dad, was the, the art of learning from your children and, um, and, and modeling wow. learning in general. So that it, it's important to show our children mm-hmm. and to show each other, not just our kids, because we're, we're modeling behavior, you and I, right here, right now, of what's mm-hmm. possible and what's not possible. Mm-hmm. And to be able to say, you know, I used to think something was right in this, in, because I was seeing it in this context, in this way. But, but now I see that it's really different. Or the thing that you just said made me see this other possibility. I learned something from you. Mm-hmm. You know, the way that you phrased that. Or, or you know, with my kids sometimes, you know, they, they're teenagers and they say these things. <laughs> Mom, you're so ba ba ba. And I realize, you know, I would really like to get on my high horse and tell them to be more respectful and that they shouldn't, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, um... But actually, they're right, Uh and it's something I'd really rather not admit, but that they are, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, and that there's there's so much in that, in Mm -hmm. terms of 
destabilizing these kind of cultural scripts that define what our role is as a parent and limit what the, I mean, what is, what is authority? What is respect? Right. right. And in our world, we have this notion that it has to do with being bulletproof. You, you've got to be right all the time. And if you're ever wrong, your credibility. What you're saying. Which is ridiculous. has to do with, because I watched it in the beginning of the film when you, you have some clips of when you were just a little, little girl, you know, in the conversations mm -hmm. with dad, you know, where he was asking you about something about why you were, you know, how did you know or how do you think? And it was just beautiful. But what you're saying is it's influence. It's like that you're allowing that there's an influence that goes back and forth instead of That's that you're right. uninfluenced. And you're, there's, so there's two things. You model learning and you're, the people around you, whether they're children or otherwise, but particularly children, learn what you're learning because right. you're sharing it with them. You verbalize it. I mean, little things, whatever. I used to think the coffee grinder functioned this way. I was so wrong. I see that it goes this way. Um, whatever it is. It could be big. Yeah. It could be small. Um, and so the, there's that. That they go, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, it does work that way. But they're also learning to learn. Yeah. Which is that's the, the piece. That's the gift. That's, that's the gift. And the reverse of that. Is, is while that's a double gift, the reverse is a double loss. Mm -hmm. It's true. Where you don't learn what somebody else is learning. They hoard it in their quiet little space because they're afraid <laughs> to expose themselves for not having known it to begin with, right? That's true. Um, and there's no learning to learn. Mm -hmm. So that's Beautiful. a double loss. What do you hope to, what we're going to... Um, we have a little bit more time left, but um, not too much. But it, what, what do you want to accomplish in getting your film out there? What are you hoping to spread out into the world? Yeah. Um, you know, really I have to just fun. say that I never expected to have the kind of response that, that, that has happened with the film. So... Wow. Um, I didn't, I didn't have Sony Pictures behind me. I didn't have any yeah. big funders. This is such a grassroots movement and an independent film. I mean, I have credits, but if you look closely, you know, in the photographers, there's Nora Bateson. In the cinematographers, there's Nora. I was trying to stretch it out as much as I could because I wanted it to look professional. But... Um, but, uh, you know, it's, I, it's my Facebook site, it's my website, it's me out there making phone calls, and, and this incredible word of mouth, mm -hmm. underground, grassroots thing that has taken, taken flight. Mm -hmm. And what I do and what I'm loving doing is just going around with the film and holding the conversation. What it right. does is it... it you know, you were saying it rearranges your mind. Yeah, it does. And it's, it's only an hour. It's, and it's a sweet little film, and it's very uncynical. And, and somehow at the end of an hour, you get a room full of 300 people, or whatever it is, who are ready for a completely different level of conversation. Totally. That's and that is so true. powerful. <laughs> and... Uh, it's just incredible because, you know, it, um, it's the kind of conversation that we need and we know we need to be able to, to take in the complexity of the issues we face. We're going to have to be able to use uh, a different kind of thinking that embodies that complexity, but embodies it with heart and simplicity and without being complicated. Okay, there's complexity yeah. and then there's and complicatedness, right. right? And complicatedness yeah. is what happens when you try to solve problems in linear ways. Yeah, that's true. You can't. Yeah, really. They just get well, complicated. I want, I want to make sure <laughs> um, people know where your, web, your website is, anecologyofmind.com. Mm -hmm. Is there another website too, just in case they forget that, just if they look up Nora Bateson, will they find you? Nope, I just used no. that one. Okay, so an, a -N, ecology of mind com, And can they download your film? I mean, how can they see it if, you're not, if you don't happen to be in their town? 
Um, well, they can't download it yet because okay, I'm still soon. paying off my credit card bills. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, soon they'll be able but, to buy uh, it or soon. It's for sale for institutional use if people want okay. to use it in schools or with groups, but that is uh, comes with a licensing fee that uh, is for showing it to groups, but that's through Bullfrog Films. Okay. And in Canada, it's um, uh, through McConnelly. Okay. And um, but if they go to your website, they can f- they can the, reach you, right? Or and the find Facebook. out the schedule. Are you still you're still showing things in America? Oh yeah, I'm about to come Good. east. Actually, I'm going to uh, work tomorrow to Barnard College with Rex Weiler, who started Greenpeace, one of the founders okay. of Greenpeace, and then Casanova and all over the Northeast, um, Woodstock area, and so on. Great, um, New Jersey. I- so one one just last thing um uh so an ecology of and um i need to just just tell people one last thing before uh we're complete um and then i want to thank you because i could have talked to you a lot longer <laughs> just privately about all the things from the film <laughs> the facebook information is probably more useful if you're okay, on good. facebook where's that there's a facebook page that's just an ecology of mind Perfect. And um, there's also my Facebook, Nora Bates, and, and if anyone wants to get in touch with me, that's a really good way to do it. And what happens is people who've never scheduled screenings in their lives or made a phone call to a theater's administrative office are creating these these screenings and these conversations. That's great. So we should, well, we'll have to organize so one in Santa Fe. Yes, mm. let's do that. Yeah. Yeah, the Santa Fe I would Institute. love that. That would actually be perfect. Um, so one last thing, just to let everybody know, our next show is next week, April 3rd, um, at 11 o'clock on Tuesday. And, um, I'm going to be talking about twin souls, uh, which is the sacred union of beloveds, which is, uh, something I've experienced. Um, I know to be true. And, you know, in, in your film, you also were saying, or it was an interview that you did, you know, the relatedness, death doesn't change the dance of relatedness. Um, and it doesn't. Uh, so we're going to talk uh, a bit about, you know, what distinguishes, you know, a certain kind of relatedness that can, that's possible between human beings. So that'll be next week. So I want to thank you for our conversation, but I really want to thank you for also as a woman, your courage to just take it on, you know, to, to make the film, which was, you know, somewhat, you know, to do what you did in an hour was, I'm sure must have felt somewhat impossible before you started it. And then to just <laughs> still does. This, you know, to just do it. You know, that you just did it and you brought it through and that you brought that out into the world because it's um, you know, there's so many things that push back on us to have us not do that. So I really wanna thank you for your courage. And your thank you for seeing that. I appreciate it. Yeah, and I really it do. Was, of course it's I love doing it. So <laughs> Yeah. That's and the also best just, part. Just, just enjoy, you know, I mean, enjoy the joy of, because it's the ripe time for the conversation, clearly. Mm. It's clearly. so ripe. Um, so I'm sure your dad, wherever he is, is celebrating um, the conversation continuing, you know, through his beautiful daughter. I hope so. so. Thank you. Yeah, I have no Thanks. doubt. <laughs> um, So I want to thank everyone, and um, we will talk to you next week. Okay, goodbye.